Welcome to Sexually Charged Radio. I'm your co-host, Ruthie, and I'm here with... Thomas. Hi, Thomas. How are you today? I'm wonderful. How are you doing, Ruthie? I'm feeling good. Um, I have a question for you about Valentine's Day. Do you, I know that people will be listening to this on other dates, but do you, think, um, do you think it's a big scam? Do you think it's a wonderful thing? Do you think something in the middle? I, I probably fall somewhere in the middle. I think it's nice to be reminded that, uh, you know, we need to have more love in our lives in lots of different ways. Um, so I like that aspect. I wish it could happen every day of the year, and I wish that the chocolate wasn't so much more expensive this time of the year. Oh, cheaper the day after. Uh, so much cheaper. So what about you? What are your thoughts on this? Um, I do think that it's a day that can be quite oppressive and dis- distressing for many people, and it has been very heterosexually focused and cis-sexually focused, mm. cisgendered sexuality focused, which um, has, has distressed me at many times. Um, I do like an excuse and a reminder to celebrate love in its many forms. So, you know, we're going on a triad date tonight and stuff like that. We have another one in a few days. Um, But I also, around Valentine's Day every year, try to, as a sex educator, give at least one workshop that's designed specifically for solo things um, to talk about our, our sexual or loving relationship with ourselves. So um, I did a I did a spanking workshop, which was a relational thing, um, but people could attend it solo. Actually, weren't, there was no impetus to attend with a partner. But um, later on, I'll be giving a workshop at a sex event that is um, that only allows masturbation while I read dirty stories out loud. So you can arrive with someone else, but you can't touch each other at all. Um, you can use toys, whatever the case may be, but it's always really important to me to have these events that um, value and focus on the self as opposed to the relational self or the relationship each year on Valentine's Day because that's self-love. important too. Yeah, in all the ways, literally and figuratively. <laughs> yep. Yeah, so so I, I love Valentine's Day, but I also... Um, I also mm, don't see it as an imperative to be in a relationship. I mm-hmm. think that's helpful. Yeah. I think the worst Valentine's Days I've had have been when I've been in relationships that were failing, but we didn't end it soon enough. <laughs> and it sort of struck out over Valentine's Day. Oh. like, I love you. You know, um, so those are perhaps my worst ones. My single Valentine's Day ones, I always had a great time with friends or by myself, just Netflix in it. Yeah, I, it's amazing how many times you hear, you know, after Thanksgiving or after Valentine's Day, the number of breakups that happen. Oh, yeah. And it's like, you know, they get they get strung along just past the holiday. Can't break up with you right before Valentine's Day or on it. Well, some people do. Can't stand you anymore the next day. Yeah, or the day of. That's true. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting, holidays and how that, that filters into our love and our relationships. But like you said, you have lots of fun with friends and lots of fun solo, um, even if you're not in a relationship. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, P. Let's talk about P. <laughs> Let's talk about the fear of urine. Wow, that was, that's a great transition. Thanks. <laughs> I'm smooth like that. Many people have commented on my smoothness. <clears throat> um, so, one of the things Thomas and I were talking about, talking to you all about, is the topic of P and kind of this P phobicness that we have in our culture um, around things to do with P and sexuality. And that could be water sports, which did cross the political horizon um, some months ago, um, but that could also, which is um, using urine in a playful manner that may be sensual or maybe sexual, water sports, um, but it could also be things like the obsession in research and common discussion about whether, you know, f- female ejaculation is, uh, is urine or not, or how much of it is urine, or did it come from your bladder, oh my god. Mm-hmm. Um, so stuff like that. Or what if I accidentally pee during sex, which comes up, especially when I'm doing workshops around sex and disability Mm -hmm. for people for whom, um, urine just kind of happens throughout the day as, as a thing. Or if I need to pee during sex and so sort of, does that ruin the mood? Does that change things? Mm -hmm. Is it healthy and necessary to pee after sex? Because people often get that suggestion, especially if they have vulvas. When is it okay to start peeing in front of your partner and using the facilities? Mm -hmm. We really are a very pee-centric nation. Yeah, and yet afraid of messing up around the mess. So um, pee. Pee can be a sexy thing for many people. It can be something that people want to urinate on each other 
or around each other uh, or things like that. And, uh, and people often get really squicked out about talking about that. I've had a number of clients and workshop attendees who have even asked specifically, when do I tell my partner that this might be something that I'm into? I'm really terrified they're just going to write me off altogether. They're not even terrified that the other person won't like it and they won't get to do it. They're just terrified of being judged mm -hmm. or simply for bringing it up. There's a lot of stigma around urine and water sports, and and I feel like that stigma really falls into this idea of of people making jokes at the expense of, of the fetish. Mm -hmm. um, you know, oh, you know, you're an awful person, therefore you're gonna like this, or that's such a terrible way of trying to how it's used in society. But, but it isn't. Yeah. I mean, it's something that uh, has comedic value and then we know something or it's, you know, it's given comedic value. And then we, then we know something about that movie or TV character. Oh, they're one of those people. We know everything because of the P like, so you, you made reference to the political nature and, um, pre uh, Donald Trump was, claim or had this there's, claim yeah, there's against some paper him about work that said maybe you know the p gate story um i think Why it was is a, everything at gate at the I, end now it was so long ago blame richard nixon okay. um for everything so what i found after that though was the number of memes and images that were created that weren't so much even about donald trump i mean they were at a high level but ended up becoming very stigmatizing to people who would have a fetish um, that involved urine and water sports. And it just got me thinking, you know, yes, there, there are issues about a president who could be blackmailed, but there's a bigger issue, or maybe not a bigger, but there's another issue of how we're having this conversation and really judging a behavior rather than the blackmail risk. Yeah, so we're, we're, we're more focused on the stigmatized thing than we are around the things that may be of actual concern. So we stigmatized sex work and we stigmatized pee mm -hmm. in that story and just made those things the focus. But l lots of people do enjoy a play with pee um, and, and that's absolutely healthy and normal. There's nothing to say, and I, I say that from a, um, like, from a fun perspective, not in terms of being a medical, medical practitioner, practitioner um, saying that it's completely healthy because I think there are considerations there to think about that I'm sure we'll talk about. As with any bodily fluid. Um, but like, there's nothing overtly or specifically wrong with enjoying water no. sports and we need to break down that stigma. Right. So for some folks, water sports can, by the way, this is not an obligation for anyone to be into water sports either. It's not like there's an imperative to be into all things, um, but rather perhaps to not be judgmental about things like this. And, and, you know, to recognize that if somebody trusts you with this information about themselves, it's a gift of intimacy. It's, it's not an obligation. It may or may not be an invitation. Um, but, uh, you know, you can, a person can appreciate that some folks are into pee without being into pee themselves. Um, I'm personally very neutral about pee. I'm like, okay, like I can see that. I don't personally get it, but it also doesn't really distress me. Um, but I've certainly met many people and had many wonderful conversations and also witnessed some people enjoying by invitation mm -hmm. things around pee. And so, you know, it can be, um, it's warm. It's from a very intimate part of the body. There's a sensual nature to it. There's an intimacy to it. There's a taboo breaking to it. Um, it may be identity affirming within certain subcultures and things as well. And uh, it can be it can be a playful thing. Some people really enjoy, you know, taste and smell and sight and all those things with urine. Um, it can be a dominance and a power thing as well. It can be a planned thing, or it yeah. can be surprise. And totally. there's this ask. Not saying that you should ever just surprise someone by peeing on them. There needs to be within a prior negotiated context. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Um, but there can be that aspect to it where you know you build up within yourself, um, not going pee beforehand knowing that you're going to be meeting up with someone who it's been negotiated that you um, that you're both into water sports and so there can have this um excitation of mm -hmm. oh this is happening and i'm working towards it and i'm planning it and it's going to be you know this a bond that gets gets built mm -hmm. um through that like long-term play sure there's there's skills that can be involved of like aim and timing people sometimes plan their dietary stuff around it it can be a sharing thing it can be a solo thing it can be a thing with lots of fetish gear it can be a thing with none whatsoever so there's there's a lot of uh a lot of kind of dynamic potential in this that makes a lot of sense to me 
Yeah, and I, I think because of that versatility of it, it's also, it's so hard to say, you know, let's talk about water sports or let's talk about the fear of pee because there are so many components to it, which mm -hmm. is really exciting. Um, so someone who might disclose to you that they're interested in this, I think the next question would be, well, what does that actually mean? What kind of activities and what aspects of it turn you on and what aspects are exciting before immediately just saying, no, 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 I'm, I'm against like, this. What? Now I know all these things about you. You're a horrible, dirty, terrible person. No, it's, you know, what is it about that process? Because I think for a lot of us um, who maybe have never engaged in water sports or um, observed um, individuals engaging in water sports before, is that we might not fully understand all of the complexities that, that make it exciting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but you're in place roles other than fetish too. So for instance, it's not unusual for people with internal genitalia, people um, likely assigned female at birth, to find vaginal penetration more pleasurable if your bladder's at least half full because it just, just makes everything a little bit more intense than closer quarters at that point in time. So people use pee in a non-fetish way that way all the time. Um, you know, sometimes uh, you talked about the intimacy of like, uh, when, when do we know it's okay to pee in front of each other in a relationship? What is your, what is your guidelines for that if you ever do it at all? <laughs> um, so for me, it, that's, anything that happens in the bathroom is like fairly, restrictive mm -hmm. <laughs> in my life um, but I think there comes a point where you just you've seen this person in this body of a partner do so many other things you're just kind of like oh yeah this is there's just something else coming out of there yeah. um, and kind of gets a little, just a little normalized yeah, yeah everybody poops everybody pees um, maybe in different ways and in, you know through different devices depending on um, well-being but you know Pee is a natural part of consuming liquids and consuming foods that yep. your body needs to um, to develop and, and then excrete. Mm -hmm. So I think for me, um, there's usually a, a couple month period that I prefer before a partner is like, yeah, I'm going to leave the door open um, before I pee. But that also changes depending on the person. And sometimes it's like, yeah, this just seems natural and... Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes it's how easygoing the other person is that kind of co-creates that comfy space. Yeah. And some people want to have that privacy. I mean, especially if you live with other people that are around a lot, sometimes it's nice to have a little room that you go into and close the door and you can be freaking by yourself for a little while. Mm. Um, clearly, I have some feelings <laughs> about this. But, but also, you know, just the comfort factor. But, you know, sometimes you just want to continue the conversation, but you have to be. So the door's open, so this thing happens. Mm. Um, you know, sometimes it's a, a playful or silly moment. You know, I, uh, I had this one partner a while ago where we would get into staring contests while someone was peeing and, um, like, <laughs> I, because it was actually, it was quite pee shy. So if they did this with me, I'd be like, Oh, oh God, I can't do it. I can't do it. You know? And, um, it actually made me be a bit more relaxed about my body and the topic because it would be like, yeah, but I see we have a staring contest and I am competitive. <laughs> so I'm going to get over it. I'm going to stare at you until some sort of other noise happens from one of us and I can't handle it and I start giggling. But, um, you know, I mean, there's, there can be all, all sorts of things in that direction. And then for some people, pee just happens during sex. And it's not a kink and it's not a fetish. Um, it's just a bodily reality. Mm -hmm. So it could be that bladder control is a factor. It could be um, that there are different apparatuses that help with the uh, relieving of excretions and that those things are kind of always happening or they have to be maybe disconnected in some way. And so it could happen in a different way for feces as well as urine. And that's just reality um, for folks. And, uh, you know, I've, I've had many conversations with people who um, were newly in a place of having to disclose this to people. It hadn't been such a consideration previously. And were, were so concerned that they would never find love because they'd have to disclose this earlier in the relationship or prior mm -hmm. to any sexual part. And, uh, you know, such a loss to the world that, um, that uh, a wonderful relationship you know, might, might not even be approached because mm -hmm. of, because of the concern of that judgment. Cause it's, it's really not that big of a deal. Well, exactly. I mean, it's, it's part of a body. It's mm -hmm. part of the human process and you're doing so many other things. If it's a sexual relationship with someone, you know, there's often the sharing of saliva through kissing. Mm -hmm. There is sharing of, um, vaginal, um, 
juices or semen or butt stuff butt stuff and lube and sweat and tears maybe mm-hmm. um yeah I mean, like, like the, the beauties in the mess there's that. like sex is not a clean process for That's most a people hilarious process and so P is just one other little piece and and sometimes you know you're so relaxed that Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes a little pee dribbles out or comes out or spurts out. Like, you just... <laughs> I'm going to giggle. Like, the word spurt did it for me. But you're absolutely right. Um, I am going to interject to mention that we're on Sexually Charged Radio at 93.3 FM in the Guelph area. You can find us on YouTube through um, YouTubing, Googling uh, Sexually Charged. We also stream on CFRU's website. People can send in questions to asksc at uaguelph.ca, and that, those will be fielded by the folks at Student Wellness who help us with editing, all kinds of good stuff in our collaboration. Back to talking about spurting. Um, <laughs> but that's true, right? And there, and there are different facts. And so for folks where, where urine just happens, you know, they also are, you know, they're aware of that with their bodies most of the time and will plan about it and things like that too. So, you know, so if that's a reality in your life, likely you've emptied your bladder and try not to drink a whole lot of liquids right beforehand. But there's also, you know, wonderful products like um, like these waterproof picnic blankets or there's ones that are made just for sex that, that cost more called Throws by Liberator, um, where that's a nice fabric on the outside and a plastic sheet on the inside and it's machine washable. And it's a great way to protect your bedding or couch or floor or whatever um, from all the things, not just PEP is probably the easiest to wash out thing just about that, that could happen. Um, but they're also like luxurious and central and can be like a great cue that something fun and sexy is about to happen when the super velvety awesome light comes <laughs> out. Um, there are, you know, scented candles and pillow sprays and things if you're very averse to certain scents or you're just worried about them being noticed. Um, there's, you know, using all kinds of different liquids and lubes and things on your body so that a little more liquid doesn't really make any difference and it's not mm. going to be super noticeable. And you know what? Maybe you take a shower afterwards with your partner. Or during. And yeah. Have sex in a hot tub. Nobody's going to know there. Yeah. Because so. I'm from peas in the hot tub anyway. <laughs> true. We don't talk about it. It's a fact of life. Um, but I think, like, there are ways that those situations where they can feel awkward in the moment can actually become an added part to the sexual experience. hmm You know, yeah, that maybe that happens. Maybe pee happens unintentionally, intentionally. And you laugh it off and decide to turn it into the next part of, well, now we're going to move into the shower or the bathtub or the hot tub. And yeah. And it becomes a different type of experience. Yeah. Or it just doesn't, it just doesn't matter. So, oh my goodness, I don't know how much to disclose. This isn't even about pee. Um, I was at an event and there were some people who were um, having an orgy, basically. And um, it was really intense sex going on. It was really like an honor to be able to watch it happening um, in this space. And like watching the dynamics between the people was great and things like that. And um, somebody pooped a little bit. And because these are mature, caring adults who are comfortable with each other in their own bodies, there was a a quick cleanup of the situation and then just a resuming to continue. And I thought to myself, like, what a great thing about aging. That's what I chalked Mm -hmm. it up to. Life experience might make you more comfortable with your body and more comfortable to realize, like, sometimes things just happen. In fact, frequently something will happen, Mm -hmm. whatever it may be. And, like, nobody... As far as I saw, nobody was embarrassed. Nobody was dissuaded. Team effort, quickly addressed, continue on with the fun, whatevs. Um, and and I thought to myself, man, I wish everybody could kind of see this to mm. just feel more comfortable about their own bodies. Well, I think it's interesting as you were talking about that. I, I thought like, you know, parents who have had, you know, children, had babies who like, you know, diapered and, you know, what parent has not been peed on? Mm-hmm. Um, I have pets. I don't even have children. And I've had so many urines on me just in my pet household. And we don't, you know, shame babies or pets. I mean, maybe a little bit we do uh, through joking at babies or, you know, pets. Mm -hmm. We, like, send them to their crate or something sometimes. But Oh, that's kinky. (laughs) But, like, Like it's just interesting that we have these different, you know, expectations. Right. Well, and with value judgments on it, too. So we might say, like, it's only okay for babies to pee, you know, or it's only okay for babies and animals or something like that. But but in reality, that could be a learning opportunity of, like, it's, it's okay for all bodies. These things just happen. And, and again, like, if this is your biggest worry in life, that's that someone might pee a little bit, like, 
I envy the lack of problems that you have in your life mm. to deal with, that this would be such a big thing for you, you know? So one of the things you brought up earlier was the idea of peeing after sex. Yeah. And I know that's, it's been discussed in a, in a lot of different websites, um, as I was becoming educated about sex and sexuality because the internet was my, mm -hmm. was my source for a lot of that. Um, when they were talking about men, they said, you know, after you um, ejaculate, it's always good to, to go pee right afterwards. So have you heard that before? I've heard it for people with vulvas, but not for people with penises. Um, that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. It might just be what I'm more drawn to reading. Um, I do have, have had quite a few clients over the years who have really chronic um, bladder infections and things like that. So, so figuring out adaptations to reduce the risk on that, both medically and behaviorally, um, is a big thing in their lives sometimes. So I probably am doing more reading in that direction. Mm -hmm. um, bladder infections are possible for people of all anatomies, but more common with a shorter internal urethra. Yeah. Um, what I've heard is that uh, for people with, uh, with a vulva and internal urethra like that, well, I guess it's, in, it's internal technically for everybody just about but uh, is that it just kind of helps flush everything out but also the process of being aroused for many people with vulvas um, means that like your kidneys kick in and filter a lot of water really quick and your bladder gets um, full abnormally quickly just because of arousal for mm -hmm. quite a few people and um, there's guesses as to what the purpose of that may be maybe it is for that more stimulation factor that I discussed earlier or maybe it's to encourage people to urinate after penetrative activity because there may be health benefits to it. Um, but what have you read about with people with penises with this? Why would that be? So, and I can't, uh, I can't speak to the veracity of a lot of these things because... Mm -hmm. A lot of times we been, just don't know. Yeah, I was going to say, but it's also been just years and years mm -hmm. since I, I would have read these things. So back in the dark ages of the internet. Mm -hmm. um, and it said that it that urinating afterwards can be just a good way of fleshing out uh, the, the, the urethral canal. Oh, um, bacteria and stuff or something. Yeah. yeah, just that, you know, if if not all semen fully is, is escapes, it can just assist um, with clearing the, clearing the canal. So, again, I can't say the full veracity of that statement, but from, like, a, a simple thought process, it's like, okay, well, it, urine does clear out that process and sure. with penis. Um so I think in general, I don't think it, if you don't have to pee right afterwards, it's probably not going to be the end of the world. Um, can't hurt to force out a few drops. But yeah, I mean, it's I also can. important to be hydrating during sexual activity. Totally. Oh my gosh, um, water bottle all the time. So just in general, your body probably could use uh, a good flush. So speaking of flushing... Um, I also mentioned earlier that there, there's kind of an obsession with determining whether um, what's called female ejaculate, so anybody with a vulva um, and a, a, an expulsion of liquid during uh, proceeding, during or after orgasm. Um, and sometimes it comes out like a flood, and sometimes it comes out like a jet, and sometimes there's a lot, and sometimes a little, and some people don't do it at all. Uh, and is that pee, right? So the, the research that comes out always kind of has a different opinion on it, so I don't know that we're all settled on that yet. It could be that the, um, that the liquid is coming from the bladder. Recent research suggests that and talked about how the bladder may be a multifunction organ and that it's not so much about filtering out and it being urine, like a high urea content, but more just um, that's a source of liquid that's expelled and maybe for health reasons or pleasure reasons or anything like that. But uh, people get really worried, what if I peed? What if um, the fluids that are happening around my vulva are being expelled from my body are urine? And, you know, um, a bit of sadness in me because I'm like, you know, if it feels great for you, who cares? Mm -hmm. Who cares? It's not harming uh, someone. Right? And so the, the sex educator answer that we've been kind of taught or encouraged to say is like, no, it's not pee when it comes from your bladder. It's not the same thing as pee and just wet the bed. And it, and it is different from that mm -hmm. with that ejaculatory function. Um, but if it does come from your bladder or it does contain trace or more elements of urine, like congratulations on feeling so great that stuff happened. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, your body was so excited and so in the throes and so um, into the moment mm -hmm. that, you know, it just relaxed and it let loose. It spurred it. That's like, that's a, that's a, like congr again, I, that's, I mean, <laughs> if, if I help to make that moment occur for someone else, I feel quite flattered and honored. Like, mm -hmm. yes, this thing that I, I hoped was working well was working well, I hope. <laughs> But it, it does really come back to that stigma of a pee and that, mm -hmm. you know, 
why does it matter if, it, if it's not hurting anyone, if it's not causing pain to the individual in which it's happening to, then, you know, can we just celebrate the moment and, and change that conversation to let's focus on the pleasure and the positivity. Mm-hmm. I don't think that's asking too much. No, absolutely. But you know, it is difficult in our culture to be okay with our bodies as they are. Uh, right. Cause then what would they sell us? <laughs> um, speaking of being okay with our bodies as they are, another question that was submitted is erectile dysfunction possible in young men. Yes. Yes, yes it, is. <laughs> it is. But I want to break this down a little bit and even say what we define as erectile dysfunction. A lot of people are like, oh, my penis um, didn't get erect when I wanted it to or didn't stay as erect as I wanted it to, and therefore I have a dysfunction. Penises are just fickle organs. Absolutely. And that's okay. That's that's kind of yeah. the way they were built. There's no age uh, restriction on how penises work and when they work and when they don't work. Mm-hmm. Um, there are lots of factors that influence erections. Um, situational like factors, psychological factors, prescriptions, so prescriptions, um, alcohol, just marijuana. being turned on or not. Like some people think that someone with a penis is just supposed to be auto turned on if there's an opportunity. That's not true. No, um, if you're too hot, if you're too cold, if um, you have an irritation or an injury on your body somewhere, there are so many things that can distract and can um, just cause individuals to lose an erection. Having to pee mm. um, can be a major. Uh, factor so your bladder just causing a lot of pressure internally Mm -hmm. um and that's not always the factor but there are lots of ways that um erections cannot last and you can still have so much fun and you can still orgasm without an erection totally Uh, there's i mean there's medical reasons too um like it can be one of the implications of diabetes and other things like that and um you know circulatory issues and things you speak to your physician about those um but you bring up a good point you know you don't need an erection to have an orgasm you can do that through um, penile or prostate or other stimulations and a lot of people don't realize that you can also have like so many great ways of having sex without an erect penis involved yeah so i just i would encourage you that if you are feeling concerned if you're worried about it if it's causing you distress to talk to your medical practitioner and your pharmacist because sometimes they know the 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 stuff about um, oh, pharmacists prescriptions in them you can always call a pharmacist on the phone and not say who you are you can tell them what meds that you're taking and you can tell them about like street drugs or whatever else you're doing too and they will give you information on that yeah i mean some pharmacists prefer going to the counter and that sort of thing but just call it, a different one if it doesn't work yeah, yeah. but always check with a medical practitioner if it is distressing to you or a pharmacist um but it's not irregular for there to be erectile dysfunction among young men Mm -hmm. well on that wonderful normalizing note thank you so much for co-hosting this episode with me today thomas thank you so much for the fun with p episode oh my gosh (laughs) i love the little fun thank you so much for the fun with p episode um (laughs) it was a pleasure discussing all these things with you and i look forward to our next chat thank you so much Thank you.